I had a weird morning. Waking up in the early hours around 1 or 2 a.m., I couldn't stop thinking about the Rainbow Road course from Mario Kart 64. I don't usually dream about video games or anything, and I'm unsure if I had a dream about the Nintendo 64 masterpiece. Still, I just couldn't get it out of my head. I could hear the background music clearly like it was being played next to me, and the many twists and turns of the raceway were flying through my head. So I did what any logical person would do sat down and played through all of Mario Kart 64 in the wee hours of the morning. It had been years since I had touched the classic title from the Nintendo 64, still, I started to feel my nostalgia become satiated. Beginning with the Mushroom Cup, every racetrack, every note to the music, felt like a long-lost friend coming by for a visit. But nostalgia can be a fickle mistress. On the one hand, you get the warm fuzzies from reliving great memories from your past. Older video games have always had that effect on me. I would often spend many nights up late in my room with the volume down on my TV, playing through game after game, each story meaning something different to me and each game world now triggering those memories. But not all memories are good, and by the very nature of video games, we have all used them as a distraction. From every kind of hardship, large and small, many of us have turned to video games to cope or have a bit of an escape from what may be bothering us. For some reason, Mario Kart 64 was hitting me like that, and it was hitting me strong. But first, I want to talk about this video's sponsor. Are you ready for the raid? Raid Shadow Legends, am I correct? You know I am. Are you into RPGs that are quick to get into and you can just play on your phone? Raid Shadow Legends is for you. But you're saying, Mantis, everybody knows Raid Shadow Legends. And of course you do, but did you know that it's one of Raid's anniversaries coming up? It's been two years since Raid has taken over the entire mobile landscape, and they're throwing a big party about it. That's right, this month is Raid's two-year anniversary, and the schedule is absolutely packed with amazing events. They've got six straight weeks of anniversary events and tournaments running from March 1st all the way through the middle of April, all of them with insane prizes to win. They're even launching their first clan vs. clan tournament to give players a chance to compete directly against another clan to see who comes out on top. And if that's not enough, they're also releasing the first champion in the badass looking Shadowkin faction, which I can't wait to see. I'm definitely going to try to get my hands on them. What I like most about Raid Shadow Legends is having an RPG that I can just pick up on the go. Jumping into battles, jumping into different champions. It's fun to check out, it's fun to play for just a little bit, and you can pick it up and put it down at any time. Raid's huge already and their whole anniversary event makes it an awesome time to join the Raid community. So don't wait around. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan my QR code and you'll get a free epic champion, Jotan, who is amazing for Doom Tower, 100,000 silver, 50 gems, and 3 ancient shards, so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. All of these treasures will be waiting for you here, and you gotta make sure to claim it soon because this will only be available for the next 30 days and only for new players. Once you're in-game, you can find me under the name TKS Mantis, and if you're fast, you can join my clan. And it's that easy. Just click the link in the description, and I'll see you in-game. I can remember being a young kid when the Super Nintendo came out, and one of my fondest memories is playing Super Mario World or Super Mario Kart with my older sister. Sitting on the shag rug, crisscross, close up to the small TV, I can't think of a better memory around that time. I can still feel the carpet. It's a nice feeling. But something about waking up in the middle of the night thinking about Rainbow Road was so haunting. It made me feel uneasy, and it made me feel like I had to play it, just to get to that special course. I started asking myself if there was something I needed to see. If I had such a strong pull to engage with a game I would typically just look back on, I just had to fire it up. Mario Kart 64 would hit the United States in 1997, and as we all know, everyone loved it. It was a tremendous upgrade from Super Mario Kart, and it really defined the kart racing genre moving forward. There's no surprise there. I decided that I would just coast through all the cups to really get a feel for Mario Kart 64 again. I didn't feel like loading up Rainbow Road was the right way to go. I wanted to build up to it. Starting with the Mushroom Cup, Luigi's Raceway would be the first track that I would sink my teeth into. There's not a whole lot to say about this course, it's a pretty basic introduction to handling the game. Nice easy turns on a straightforward raceway. Of course, you got the Luigi Bloon watching over everyone like the god he is. 
Up next was Moo Moo Farm, a favorite of mine when I was a kid. The dirt track is a nice change from the standard racetrack hosted by Luigi. One of my favorite things about this course is the moles that would jump out of the holes trying to stop you from getting the deed done. This is one of the best tracks in the game. Short, fun, and filled with character. Koopa Troopa Beach would show its face now, adding another significant change of scenery to a beautiful ocean island with a large rock formation resembling a turtle in the middle of it. There's a shortcut jump through a cave here that I didn't pull off during the playthrough, but at this point most anyone watching this already knows about this anyways. One of my favorite things about this course is the small crabs that crawl around the shore. I think it adds a nice touch to an already iconic stage. The Mushroom Cup continues to deliver on iconic racetracks, with Calamari Desert being next, the cup's final race. This course is an obvious favorite of mine as well. Damn, it's like all these tracks are my personal favorites. The train that travels through the center of the level had always impressed me, especially when I was young. I just thought it was cool to see this moving set piece that even affected the race by blocking parts of the track. Calamari Desert is god tier. This led to our first ceremony at Peach's Castle, of course, most recognizable from Super Mario 64. After dominating the Mushroom Cup, it was time to focus on the Flower Cup, starting with Toad's Turnpike. This was another level, like Rainbow Road, that I was feeling nostalgic about. I either played this track a lot as a kid or something because I felt strong nostalgia feelings as I went through the race. Something about the backdrop of the dusk sunset on a crowded highway really hit me. The other vehicles on this turnpike act as a worthy adversary. They can be quite a game changer at the slightest slip up. Frappe Snowland would be the next track to change things up. Something I really enjoy about the Mario Kart series is how diverse the tracks are, especially in Mario Kart 64. This winter wonderland has some extraordinary snow sculptures of Yoshi and Mario. The snowmen that litter the raceway are a great touch, a true classic for sure. Choco Mountain greets us now, and to be honest, it's a rather forgettable course. I mean, I remember it just fine, it just doesn't hit me as hard as some of the others. I have always wondered about the Mario universe. When something is named Choco, does it mean that it's all made out of chocolate? I often thought this was just some dirt racetrack, especially with the boulders that try to smash you from around the bend. Still, if it's all chocolate, I guess that adds a bit of spin to it and proves the point even more about Mario Kart's diverse levels. Finally, we hit Mario Raceway to end the Flower Cup. It's a lot like Luigi's Raceway, of course, with the race going clockwise instead of counterclockwise. Of course, there are major differences between the levels, I'm just commenting on the layout and the actual terrain. The big pipe always stuck out in my head, as I suppose it was supposed to, a calm way to end this cup. After another ceremony, showing off our domination, it's time for the Star Cup, where things get interesting. Up first, the iconic Wario Stadium. First off, there is some kind of crazy jump people do on this level that I have never been able to pull off well enough to form it into a solid strategy. For the most part during this playthrough, I wanted to go through all of the courses again for like nostalgia's sake, which meant doing it the good old fashioned way. I have always loved this course. It gave me a big race vibe. A stadium packed with people, not to mention you have Wario's beautiful mug staring down at you for most of the race. The track is based on motocross layouts and features many bumps, jumps, and dips, making it a lot of fun to bomb through. The infamous Sherbert Land is the next race in the Star Cup, and it can be a real son of a bitch. If it isn't the slippery ice surrounding a water pit, it's the tight turns in the claustrophobic cave, and the cute little penguins do nothing but make this worse. This level is a classic, but it can bring up some frustration that can't be forgotten. We now arrive at one of my all-time favorites, the Royal Raceway. As a kid, this racetrack blew my mind for a seemingly small reason by today's standards. Peach's Castle. The fact that you could drive around the front of the castle was such a big deal and a really neat addition. As for the rest of the course, it offers some sharp turns and big boosts to make for an exciting race. For the Star Cup finale, we hit Bowser's Castle, another favorite. The overall aesthetic of this level is stellar. It gives off a perfect vibe for Bowser's home course, and the track itself can offer some challenging twists and turns. I love driving through his castle and avoiding the womps while navigating the various rooms it holds. Top tier race track. After another domination ceremony, we arrive at the Coupe de Gras, the special cup. Hitting DK's Jungle Parkway first, this level stands out for so many reasons. The dense jungle environment, the waterfall, the big old boat that patrols the waterway. While this track isn't one of my favorites, it is one of the most iconic in the series. Very memorable and a great start to the special cup. Up next, Yoshi Valley sets out to confuse the lot of us. The Nintendo 64 version of this racetrack hides who's in the lead, though you can see if it's you by using the minimap. The twists and the loops in this level can get a bit crazy, making it hard to tell which way you are going. Banshee Boardwalk, perhaps one of the best names for a racetrack, is up next. 
Switching to a haunted house setting, this level offers sharp turns and a great aesthetic. Seeing Booze haunt the course in an appearance from the giant fish from the winning ceremony is excellent. I have always enjoyed the bats that push the racers back as well. It wouldn't be a Mario Kart game without a Booze haunted house level. Finally, we have made it to the whole reason I picked this back up in the first place. The course that had burned itself into my mind so hard that it was the first thing I thought about waking up all these years later. Rainbow Road. And it didn't disappoint. The music hit me like a ton of bricks as the longest race in the game started. The big hill at the start beckoning to me as I started my journey through the neon soaked wonderland that is this level. One of the things that I have always loved about this track is the neon lights representing the characters that surround the map. In fact, that could be the most nostalgic part of Rainbow Road to me. Something about the neon is calming and troubling to me. To call back to the beginning of the video, something about these neon signs makes me feel uneasy. I don't know if it's just a bad memory or a fear of neon, but it's there. As for the level itself, as I mentioned before, it's the longest race in Mario Kart 64, so it allows you to soak in this masterpiece. Dodging the chain chomps can prove more and more challenging as they seem to seek you out better the further you are into the race. This is by far the most memorable race of the game, and it's, of course, a top favorite of mine. Overall, the nostalgia trip was worth it. For around an hour of my night, I was flooded with memories, both good and bad, like chatting with an old friend. You remember the good times and the bad, and Mario Kart 64 delivered. Of course, there are much more technologically advanced Mario Kart games these days, like Mario Kart 8 Deluxe on the Switch, another favorite of mine, which even features some of my favorite levels from Mario Kart 64, fully realized in this new engine the series calls home. It even has Rainbow Road, though it cuts down the time by making it a checkpoint race instead of using laps. Beyond that, it feels like you are returning to these tracks after all these years and seeing how much they've changed, which gives you a whole new level of nostalgia. Mario Kart 64, like the rest of the games in the series, is a fun, finely crafted racing game. I'm hard pressed to find another game like it that I enjoy playing as much. It could just be my affinity for the Mario characters, as that whole universe has been one of my favorite things for as long as I can remember. But regardless of how many games hit the series or how much time has gone by, Mario Kart 64 will always be the classic that really set it into motion. The 3D racetracks, the unique environments, and the overall joy it brings to players will never be forgotten. And that is why Mario Kart 64 is God tier. Thank you for checking out my video essay about Mario Kart 64, and if you want to see more video essays like this, make sure to subscribe to the channel and like this one. It really helps the channel out a lot. You know what else helps the channel out a lot? The supporters of the channel, the patrons, and the YouTube channel members. So I'd like to thank them, but a special thanks to the biggest supporters. Ian Rowley, Abdullah Athani, Popo Hum, Fireflare, JP Rivera, Zeroster, Billy Joe Jim Bob, Excel, Primark Mustard, Ice Queen Neo, Daniel Atalano, Papa Swanson, Marcus Jacobstown, Legendary Angel 94, Spencer Webb, Techie, Ruben Atwood, Phil Starsick, Bill Scott Sheets, and Edgy. Thank you guys so much for the support. You know I couldn't do it without you, and I'm internally grateful. Thank you again. I hope to catch you on the next one. It has been Mantis. Uh, I gotta testify. Come up in the spot looking extra fly. For the day you die. You gon' trust the sky, you gon' trust the sky, baby girl, testify. Come up in the spot looking extra fly. For the day you die, yeah. you gon' trust.